Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a Locked On Canadians on this week's show. We have another special guest. We're going to be talking the front office, the youth, and the roadmap to successfully rebuilding the Montreal Canadiens. All that and more inside today's show. For Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 672 of Locked On Canadians. Thank you for making us your first listen. If you're listening, it's wherever you get your podcast or your first watch. If you are watching all of our shining faces on YouTube right now, I am one of your hosts. I am Scott Metlin. I'm joined, as always, by the active stick, Laura Saba. And we have, once again, another very special guest. Today, we are joined by Blaine from the Hockey Writers and Habs Unfiltered. And uh, Blaine... Welcome to the show. Thank you for making the time for us on uh, what is a Sunday evening when we're recording this. Oh, well, thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> <laughs> and we're uh, so grateful to you for your time because this is something that we had obviously talked about way back when. And finally, I was like, you know, it's the off-season. And, you know, you know, with a daily podcast, things just run into each other and you're covering games and all the news and all of that. And now that it's the off-season, we are getting a chance to kind of meet the people that we are online friends with. Yes. And despite being online friends and podcast buds, whatever we want to call that, we're going to jump right into just asking you questions because that's what we're doing. It is the off season and we are still cranking out content every single, every other day here at Locked On Canadians. That made perfect sense in my head when I said it. Don't worry about it. Our thought is Laura and I have had our own thoughts and opinions on what Jeff Gordon, Kent Hughes, and somehow Vinny LeCavaye have had an impact on the Montreal Canadiens since being hired and brought in uh, in the second half of 2022 after they cleaned house, basically. I'm curious, though, Blaine, what your thoughts on how the front office has been doing so far and what they could do better or where they've actually had their most success because everyone's got different views on it. Some people think they've been a disaster, which I think is too much, and some people think that they're an unmitigated success. And I think going too far to either side when the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I mean, success wise, um, for me, it's more what decisions they're making and why, and it looks like they're, they're following their, their plan and they're, they're doing, they're making their choices based on that plan and the development for the future, which I'm going to be honest we haven't seen much of in the last 30 years. <laughs> God. Yeah. Which I can say because a... I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned sticking to the plan. And this is not going to be a, we're going to slander Mark Bergevin in the previous regime. We're more mature than that. A lot of what the previous regime, I should say regimes did is everything was reactive. There wasn't a proactivity to everything here. We've seen Jeff Gordon and Ken Hughes and be like, we're planning to do this and do this and get ahead of things, whether that be acquiring draft picks or shipping out contracts at the deadline where they should have been flipped. That's extra assets. It feels like they are sticking to that timeline. And I know some people think that they should just burn it all down, but I think they're very cognizant of what happens when you just burn a franchise to the ground to try and start over. Sometimes it works. You're the Rangers. Uh, sometimes it's the Buffalo Sabres. And I, I do like that this is a group that so far isn't making rash decisions with everything. Everything is done with a pace to it that makes sense. It doesn't feel overwhelming or rushed or anything like that. And I don't know if that's just me feeling that way because 10 years of abysmal pre-planning uh, has made me a very jaded hockey analyst at this point. Uh, to me, it looks like it's very calculated. They have their plan. They know what they want and they, they do go about their business based on that and only on that. And they, they pick their shots. 
I think that's a good point. And Laura, you and I have talked about this is that Ken Hughes didn't really want to trade Arturi Lekkanen until he got what he wanted. He didn't want to trade Ben Chirot until he got what he wanted. He didn't make moves for the sake of making a move. And it, it's a welcome change that someone who just goes, ah, well, trades are hard to, I'm going to get what I want one way or the other, or I'm just going to keep this player that I really like. And you can deal with that. Kent Hughes might be a rookie GM, but Jeff Gordon's been around long enough that having that support and then the other people they've brought in, I, I'm i I'm curious to see what you think, they, what else they should add to this front office a little bit. Because we saw Mark Bergevin, who was his own boss for the entire time that he was here. There's oversight, and it seems like there's actual checks and balances to the Canadians' front office now. And I think that leads to a more balanced and, uh, I, I don't want to say mature, but a better relationship and working a situation for everyone involved. Yeah, with, uh, with Gorton there, there's someone that has the experience that's been there before that has built a couple of teams already. And it's not as if Hughes is some rookie either. Well, he's a rookie GM, but he's been in hockey for 25, 30 years. And as an agent, he's very well versed in how to play chicken with the other GMs. So it's, I I believe he talks to Gorton and they base based on their discussions, they set a price for what they want for every player and Hughes has the, um, I'd say balls to <laughs> he's bold. Out. That's the thing. I love that about him. He's bold. He, yeah, he's bold. He, he's, he's got the, uh, the stones to hold on until he gets exactly what he wants, or he just walks away from the table. And the thing about having, you know, stones, cojones, whatever you want to call it is he put his neck on the line in the first day of the NHL draft. Not only picking Slavkovsky, but trading Alexander Romanov, trading for Kirby Doc, taking Philip Mayshar, and then the next day directing Lane Hudson and these guys. He went bold with everything because I, I do not know where the actual quote comes from, but fortune favors the bold is a true thing. And why sit passively when you can go up and try to be aggressive in what you want to do? Uh, and I'm curious before we go into our next uh, segment a little bit. If you were adding one thing to this front office, what would that be going forward? Because there's still openings that we know of anyways. Um, if you were adding to the management or front office staff of the Montreal Canadiens, who or what are you looking for at this point? I'm not sure who, but the what I would like to see more in the form of development or analytics or both, to be honest, because he's made great strides in putting that together. But there could be more there. Uh, and the more people he has in those, those positions, the more information they can have and the better his decisions will be. And I think that's a good part. And I do not – and we all think that you've clearly not done this offseason. It's quiet because they probably wanted a long overdue vacation. I feel like we're going to get a rash of news coming here soon with the rookie tournament just a month away here in Buffalo – We have so much more. We're going to be talking about the youths, as they say nowadays, and that's all coming up in our next segment. But first, if you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, you are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor. Of course there is, because Built is always bringing you new flavors, whether that be Built Bars or Built Puffs. So get ready for delicious, indulgent cookie dough. And that's covered in 100% real chocolate, only 160 calories, and loaded with 15 grams of protein. They're like a treat that you can take with you. You need them in the morning because you skip breakfast. Built Puffs are there for you. You need them during your workout. They're there afterwards. Take them on a hike like I do. You're taking the dog on a long walk because she's got more energy than a hyperactive toddler. Take Built Puffs with you so your legs don't cramp up and get tired halfway through. Cookie dough chunk puff, 100% real chocolate. They're healthy, tasty, and good for you. So if you go to built.com right now, put in the promo code LOCKED15, you're going to get 15% off your order. Go check it out. Keep an eye out for new flavors, new Built Puff flavors, everything. That's promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your next order. We are back with our very special guest, Blaine from the Hockey Writers and Habs Unfiltered. We got to ask, we've seen an infusion of young talent. We've seen the young stars step up a lot. Every year, it seems like there's a new face in the Canadians organization that kind of surprises people. 
Michael Pozzetto was an NHL regular last year. Yes, there were injuries, but this is a guy who went from the fourth line in the AHL to being a regular in the NHL with inside two months, give or take. So, Blaine, my question is for you. Give me someone you're keeping an eye on that you think is going to be the kind of dark horse breakout and who you think is the most likely candidate to have a breakout season this year for the Canadians, especially among the young guys. They don't even have to be in the NHL. I'm talking at any level whatsoever. Dark horse breakout. Ooh, that's a tough one. I'm going to, I'm going to wait on that one. I'm going to put that at the end, but uh, for the person I think is going to have a big year, I think it's Justin Barron. Um, Right-handed defenseman, there's not a lot of depth there. I mean, you look at their their right-hand side throughout the system, and you might be able to pick out four names. So he, he's got the doors. The door's open for him. And, I mean, he's, he's the exact type of defenseman you want in a new modern NHL, which is why, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Hughes held out. He wanted a specific thing, and that thing was puck moving defensemen who are recent first round picks, and he, he fits the bill. I think he's ready to be given some opportunities to try. It. And this year, I think he'll make mistakes. We're going to see some errors, but by the end of the year, I think his development will show that he has taken massive leaps. So I think he's going to have a, a bit of a breakout with his rookie season. And oh, the dark horse, man. There's no one like uh, like Michael Pozzetta. I mean, I've been looking for hairdos on the rest of them, and nobody <laughs> has his hair. Uh, maybe you know, I don't know if it's much of a dark horse, but uh, Yessi Alonen. I think he's ready for that step, and I think he should have an NHL job if it wasn't for the thirty-seven thousand forwards they have on roster now. Oh, and I know who you who you think should be traded off this team, but I want to go back to Justin Barron real quick because he's definitely somebody who is um, now one of the the prized prospects in the Canadian system. And I think one of the big things about him, and you would not be the first person to point this out, is that he's made a lot of strides since the moment that he got drafted and this point, right? Like he got drafted as something and people thought that maybe he was not that mobile. Maybe he was a shutdown guy and he's proven throughout his AHL play and like very brief moments in the NHL that he has changed the way that he approaches the game and he's improved upon what he's already got. And he's become a little bit more puck intelligent. He's become a little bit smarter on the ice. He's become definitely a lot more uh, mobile and creative, which is something that wasn't really expected of him at the beginning, right? There was a big question mark. And that's, that's the thing that I find really exciting is that the front office seems to be following that, right? Like they, they, they talked a lot about Slavkovsky and this, the huge strides he made this one year. Um, and I think that that's really, really important because – it's much like the front office, right? Like you can be something, but if you can show that you can evolve, some people simply just don't have the potential, but some people do and it just hasn't been brought out. And like, it looks to me that their attitude is we're going to create the right situation for all of these things to work out, whether it's the analytics or the development, giving people time, maybe being more patient with some people. So I really like that you brought up Justin Barron. And I think that that's, that's a, that's a really great idea. So I know we've got a few more minutes left. So let's talk about all of those forwards the Montreal Canadiens have right now. Um, Who do you expect they will trade away? This is, this wasn't in the rundown in the show rundown. We're kind of putting (laughs) weight on the spot right now. Uh, Who do you expect them to shop? actively what as well they're probably doing it right now actually well i would assume that mike kaufman is the top of the list i mean he is what he is he, he's he's a guy who can get some points on the power play but you can't really expect him to play any type of defense really um he's a bit of a liability in the sense that He's holding up other players. You put him on a contending team, they can bury him in a third or fourth line, put him on their power play, and he wouldn't really hurt their their team much. He would provide them the uh, the added offense that they'd be looking for. But on a team like the Canadians, who are exposed pretty much everywhere, it would hurt to keep him. So I can see them shopping him, what they're going to get in return. Uh, if Pacioretty only gets future considerations, we're going to have to see Hughes add pieces just to get rid of him. So mm, it's tough I to actually, say. I have a part to counter that though, is because remember he traded Shea Weber and got an actual NHL top six forward in return for that. The, I don't know what 
the actual market is. Because like I said, Patch already went for future considerations. We've seen very good goalies traded for literally nothing. But then Shea Weber, who is never going to play a game again, got a top six forward. Yes, someone who probably didn't want to be in Vegas. And yes, Vegas need the LTIR space. But I didn't expect them to get anything realistically for Shea Weber. And they got Evgeny Dodonov, who I keep forgetting is on this team somehow, despite the fact that he should probably be lining up on the second line this year. I do think Mike Hoffman is the guy they're going to try the most to trade. I would be shocked if he's the one to go, though, just because I think those defensive flaws. The one time he tried to play defense, he got called and gave up a penalty shot. So, like, I don't really know. It it feels almost like he's got that aura of being, like, teams don't want that. A guy who struggled on a bad team that struggled, yeah. But is he the right answer? Maybe not right away. But by the deadline, if there are teams out there looking for offense, I imagine Mike Hoffman's going to be on their list. Um. I would also, for me personally, I still think the name that Ken Hughes has been called the most about is Josh Anderson. And I do not think he's willing to part with him at least yet until he sees what the rest of this team looks like. Because if there's a forward that's going to get a stupid return, it's going to be Josh Anderson, whether we like it or not. I think he's likely the most valuable piece that is available in a trade right now. Obviously, assuming Suzuki, Caulfield, et cetera, are not. I think Josh Anderson is very high up that list because GMs love them. Some big, strong dudes who can skate fast. And admittedly, I like that too. Um, I I just don't like the idea of trading Josh Anderson currently because he's a bit of a unicorn in terms of what the Canadians have. He's he's part of the reason you're going to watch these games when the team struggles, right? Like obviously you want to see the young guys take a stride, take strides forward. But I also think that, one thing that's really important to remember is that the market can always be reset, right? Vegas took a giant crap in it uh, very recently. But at the end of the day, you look at the trade deadline and w- the way that Kent Hughes operated, right? He knows that he's going to hold on to people and he knows he's going to finesse people a lot. So I would expect Mike Hoffman, like you said, they're probably going to have to throw something in to take Mike Hoffman off the books. But I do expect them to be able to, as time goes on, reset the market. I think there's some forwards on this team in particular that um, much like much like Jeff Petrie, who in the last couple of months of the season really, really stepped up their game, right? As soon as Kent Hughes sees some some flashes where he can sell it on a GM, I think he'll pounce and, and, and try to shop again. But I also just... I find that Vegas is going to be struggling quite a bit. So we might see some more of these trades for, for nothing. I just think that Kent Hughes is going to be really smart with the timing. And I have a lot of faith in him to trade Mike Hoffman. I don't know if I have like, like full faith in him right now and his plan. I, I need to see some results. Right. But I do have faith in him to trade Mike Hoffman. And speaking of yeah. that plan and everything that goes with that, we are going to, in our final segment, we're going to talk about the roadmap to a successful rebuild. And that's all coming up next. All right, we are back. It is already somehow our final segment of the show. Time flies when you are having fun amongst podcast buds. Our, the rebuild question is one that is always very difficult, I feel like, for a lot of Habs fans to kind of wrangle with because they're torn between 10 years of should they rebuild, should they keep going for it, and this weird fence-straddling maneuver where they never did either, quite frankly. Outside of maybe 2014 when they went out and got Thomas Vanek or Jeff Petrie the following year, they never really made that next big push to be a true contender. And when things got bad... They just kept everything in place and didn't really shake up much. Yeah, they traded Alex Galchenyuk and then they traded Max Domi and et cetera, et cetera. But things never really got shaken up. And then we look at what an actual rebuild, and I have to use the Rangers for this because theirs is one that seems to have paid off a little bit. Yes, they got some help in the form of Artemi Panarin, but they trusted their pieces that they kept. Blaine, my question for you is, What do you think a successful Canadians rebuild will look like, you know, in the early to late stages here? Like, what do you think a timeline for that looks like? Uh, In your opinion, how far off do you think we are from seeing this Canadians rebuild actually like declared over at this point? Well, once they're a 
playoff team, I think the rebuild is technically over and then you're just fine tuning. So it's definitely not this year. Uh, probably not next year. I think they'll compete, but they'll fall short. So the following season, so three years from now, I believe they'll have everything, they'll, most of the things they need in place. And then it'll be some fine tuning to um, graft on pieces to whatever core they've put together. I think the big decision is who's going to stay in the core, right? And you do need that one, two, three years to see how people perform. There are going to be some players that they expect to step up right away. And this is like, they're sort of like, this is their season to prove themselves. And then there are going to be players that they just picked up who aren't even going to make the NHL until two to three years from now. So I feel like right now is a really good chance for them to just see what they've got, not really make those decisions right away. The, the way that I always put it is, you know, look at, what it looks like on night one and then look at what it looks like on night 82 and then just see you know who improved who solidified where the gaps are who really hasn't stepped up and then those people maybe they walk away with a development plan for the summer or maybe they get traded before the next draft right i think they're it, like it's it's in flux but i feel like right now we called it the luxury of time but one of our listeners k pointed out it's really the luxury of money right because you can do a rebuild the buffalo sabers way and it's like don't spend don't spend don't spend don't spend and then obviously you need the right personnel, but giving having the luxury of butts are going to be in seats no matter what. There are there is going to be corporate support. You do have players that are worth coming to the rink for, right? You've got your Nick Suzuki, you've got your Cole Caulfield, you've got maybe Slavkovsky, maybe not. You've got those guys that people will want to see. You've got you're making you've got that excitement. You've got Marty St. Louis. You've got people like you're not worried about selling tickets or advertising or anything like that so you do have the chance to just kind of be like all right let's just play this guy for you know five games let's just play this guy let's see what it goes but for me the big question is what happens when there's a little bit a little bit of adversity I think like the first test is how they deal with the salary cap but then what do they do if somebody that they took a chance on doesn't perform what if somebody they sign turns out to be an anchor contract right like what happens if another team poaches their 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 whoever it is that ends up being a star in the front office right like those are that's what I want to see as well Is like how do they deal with that but I think it's a really exciting time for Montreal Canadiens fans even though we know that we're not we're probably not in for some good hockey anytime <laughs> probably not um i don't know i i do agree with the with your with your thought on what do they do when they make a mistake how do they recover from that mistake that's going to be very telling on what what direction the team ends up going eventually and we never really saw from gorton what he would do when he was caught in a mistake because he didn't have enough time <laughs> he ended up getting fired because he didn't want to toe the line with uh, with Jeff Dolan. So I think he's going to have that luxury of time in Montreal. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to say what they're going to do. But I don't know. He, they seem savvy enough to be able to not set themselves up too bad in the long term with bad contracts or because they're, they're going to be busy mopping up the, the last regime's contracts for the next few years. So it's going to take some time. I, I I think that's part of it too, is that I originally went into this off season thinking, ah, it's not so bad. Yeah. There's some deals to move out and this and that, and they should be able to clear up the cap space on things really quickly. And then I looked at it and went, they've traded away Weber. They've traded away Petrie and that's 13 and a half million dollars off the books. And they're still up against the cap. Like, it, it, it's not to just be, belabor the point that the previous regime left them in a bad spot. They're starting from literal zero. Like they're, they're Sisyphus and that boulder just pushed them back down the hill here. And my thing with this is that with there actually being a clear plan in place on how they want to do this, I think fans are more willing to be like, okay, they're not great, but here's what they're preaching us. Here's what they're telling us that they want to do. And we're seeing pieces of that come in. They're not just saying, you know, things to say things. They're saying things because they mean it. Uh, they want to give young guys a shot. I think they would love to have like a Raphael Harvey Pinard, uh, Yessi Alonen in the NHL lineup. But if they can't, 
they're going to put them in the AHL and they're going to work to get them there sooner rather than later. And it's like you said, like within the next three years, I think is when we should hopefully is when we should see kind of an end game to this here is that we don't want to linger on, okay, well, we're still getting rid of deals. You can only do that for so long before you go, we got to build with what we've got and go for it because Caulfield needs it. Well, he needs a contract by the end of next year. Other young guys are going to need contracts. Thankfully, Nick Suzuki is already signed, but there's still work to be done. And in the next couple of years, I'm very curious to uh, see what Hughes and Gorton come up with because I, I think the best is yet to come, obviously, with them. And I'm curious what their actual best might be. Uh, before we head out, uh, Blaine, do you have any parting thoughts or anything else you'd like to share uh, with our listeners before we head out? Plug your work. like Yes, please plug your written. work. <laughs> yes, you're so no, here. Shoot my horn. <laughs> yes. This is a family show, so be careful with that. Um, yeah. I, I, I haven't done enough yoga. Um, yeah, if you want to find me, uh, you, can, you can find me at the Hockey Writers. Uh, I, I cover quite a bit of work there. Uh, recruit. Uh, sometimes I, I freelance there. Uh, Habs Unfiltered is my podcast. We recorded... Our, sh- our weekly show just this morning so you know show some love click at least you don't have to listen just click just click um and you can find me on twitter uh blaine Pudvay, thw instagram uh we're on facebook habs unfiltered so really we're we're easily found uh please don't troll me please <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, please don't troll any of our guests for that matter. We like we want to be like the podcast that people want to go on because our fans are super cool. You guys are. Don't be jerks. So uh, that will bring a wrap to this episode. As always, you can follow Laura at the Active Stick. You can follow myself at Scott Matla. Please also, I don't usually plug one of our other sites, but at Habs Eyes on the Prize, the top twenty five under twenty five is kicking off. All the five hundred plus ballots have been counted. We look forward to arguing you within the comments about where someone was ranked, even though it was a public vote. That is all coming up soon. I have a big article coming up on Carey Price's uh, career compared to Patrick Waugh and others at some point soon. I don't usually try and plug my own stuff. Um, follow the podcast. He, at- did, he did like a week of work on this, just so you know, <laughs> yeah. listeners. Like It, was, it only it was took a week a because week I stopped writing it because I got distracted watching reruns of House at 11 o'clock at night. So like, okay, it could have been. I was like, I was making the point that you were laboring over it for like an, a whole week every moment and now you just don't let... <laughs> I am not going to lie to the good people except when it's convenient to me so <laughs> anyways follow the show at LO underscore Canadians wherever you get your podcast subscribe please subscribe on YouTube we appreciate all of you and we will see you all next time